the First Nations Major Project Coalition suggests there's $575 billion worth of transactions in the queue with their 134 nations that are participants in that. Uh, the Assembly of First Nations suggests there's a $349.2 billion gap on infrastructure in Canada alone. We're not even talking housing yet, right? So the opportunity is massive. And like I said, you've got none of the, the, uh, the risks that are typical of, of emerging markets. Welcome to the Future in Sound podcast. I'm your host, Jen Wilson. This is a podcast where we talk about prioritizing people, planet, and profit. In each episode, we speak with world-leading experts who help us see the future we want and our role in it. This is episode 22, Indigenous Investment. Fred de Blasio is a proud member of the Huron-Wendat Nation and co-founder, managing partner, and chief executive officer of Longhouse Capital Partners. Prior to co-founding Longhouse, Fred served as executive vice president for the Squamish Nations Development Corporation with $1.4 billion in development. Fred is an experienced executive with a proven track record at AT AT&T, TELUS, and NVIDIA Technologies, where he had a $300 million exit. He also has extensive experience in mergers and acquisitions with over $100 billion of deals, corporate development, and marketing. Fred, it is such a pleasure to have you on the Future and Sound podcast. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. So Fred, I'm really curious to hear more about how you have moved into a really important space of investing in Indigenous businesses. What's your approach and how did you get here in your career? That's a a loaded question because I'll I'll try to be brief, but um, I had the great uh, good fortune of of studying at Cambridge and um, that's when I really got sort of the imagination got captured by Um, sustainable development. So I did my master's thesis on that. Went to Wall Street, which was a bit of a weird and shocking place to be because, you know, I I, I, I certainly believe in, perhaps because I'm Canadian, I believe in in sort of a compassionate capitalism. Um, And I don't think you get that everywhere in the world and certainly not on Wall Street. So um, I moved into large corporates where I felt, you know, telecommunications was a bit more aligned with what I wanted to do with my life. But I never lost sight of my indigeneity. I'm I'm here on Wendat. My nation's just outside of Quebec City, though. I grew up in Montreal, and so I set up some things when I was at TELUS and other organizations, you know, related to ESG, though we were calling it the environmental issues, et cetera. And then uh, through a friend, I was I was invited to um, this event where I learned how to give an inconvenient truth. So I was one of 200 Canadians chosen to give the Al Gore, you know, um, uh, Oscar-winning presentation, which is a movie. And so it was one. Of, it's always been a passion, and it's so so intimately linked to my heritage, uh, particularly on my mother's side, with respect to the seven sacred teaching, love and courage and respect and truth, humility, and, and you know, like, you know, there's a five, but there, there's two more. And, and the point being that you respect Mother Earth. You res- it's a systemic approach to life, right? Everything has uh, an interplay. And so, uh, and that really was uh, foundational in terms of my, my interest in, in everything I was doing. And then I gave back to the community by, you know, I got fortunate. I sold one of my startups to AT&T in the U.S. And so that afforded me a little bit of a, of a you know, a, I guess the, the luxury of choice, which we don't always get. And, uh, and so I decided to give back to my indigenous community and I worked for a nation uh, in their ECDEF group. And, and that was really important. But I also felt like I'd have a bigger impact. What's an active group? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, an economic development group. So in Canada, First Nations often you know, are a political body, and they set up economic development corporations in order to sort of foment business relationships and businesses in general. And it's, it's a way to sort of separate church and state, if you will, uh, from an economic standpoint. So the business of business versus the business of politics, if you will. And so that culminated in, in uh, financing for a huge development in, in downtown Vancouver 
called Sanog for the Squamish Nation. That was a $1.4 billion finan- financing we did. And uh, while I was there, you know, I was like, wow, we, we need to do something more. Like, I'm helping one nation, but I, 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 I felt the need to help more. And I had a, a fairly unique skill set in terms of my background in, in, as an Indigenous person. We barely index, um, you know, in finance. Uh, and by barely indexing, there's 19,000 CFAs in Canada. And there's only five that self-identify as Indigenous. So the lack of literacy, the lack of financial acumen, and importantly, because of, you know, Canada ratifying uh, the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, particularly Article 32.2, which is really relates to free, private, and informed consent, I felt it was critical to, to take my financial skill set and apply it in, in what was taking place in Canada and help a vast number of nations as they uh, sought to exercise their rights and finally have a seat at the finance table. And we've all read the, the newspaper stories where someone wins $50 million only to find themselves destitute and you know, homeless three years later. And after having fought so hard, uh, you know, our elders have fought so hard to, to finally get to the United Nations Declaration becoming the law of the land, I, I thought to myself, well, I, I certainly cannot. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I didn't use my skill set, which was so appropriate for, for this, the times. Um, and I'm standing on the, on the shoulders of giants that came ahead of me. And our elders were incredibly wise in, in making sure we trained lawyers historically to sort of fight within the system, if you will. Uh, because it has been a fight. And so I'm trying to do my little part to make sure we put an emphasis on financial literacy and financial acumen because I really don't want to be the homeless person, uh, you know, or find our nations as the homeless people yet again. You know, we fought so hard. And so that's a, that's been sort of the journey. Long way to answer, but, you know, there is a thread that follows through. And, and I, I've always liked building businesses, you know, um, and, and so this is, uh, this is an important, uh, you know, it's a, the legacy element of my career. You know, we're, we're keen, we're raising a billion dollars fund in infrastructure specifically to assist First Nations and their economic development corporations to have a seat at the table and make equity investments to 50% or higher in the projects that cut across uh, Indigenous ancestral and reserve lands in Canada. So there, I'll take a deep breath because I've been chewing your ear off, Jennifer, but uh, yeah, that's, that's how it all sort of fell along. That's the waterfall, if you will. What an incredible story. And I'm really interested to hear, so when did you make the decision or know that this was the direction you'd go? Were you, you know, on Wall Street thinking, I've been thinking about the sustainable development goals and, you know, this just isn't matching it. Or, you know, was it really when you sold a business and you thought, wow, I could really have a ton of options. Let me look at this. Like, when did the idea start to really um, take root for you? Um, I'd have to tell you that I, I've always been a bit restless um, in every uh, job just because, you know, uh, again, going back to the compassionate you know, capitalism, I, I've always felt like there was something missing. While I had some, you know, wonderful experiences, I, I had the great good fortune of, of running a big chunk of the, the TELUS uh, consumer solutions business, and which was a ton of fun. But I like things, uh, think about things holistically. And, and there was a part of my being that wasn't being satiated, uh, you know, in terms of what I was doing. And so the opportunity or, or you know, to help, you know, Indigenous people, my people, to use my skill set uh, and put those two things together and advance reconciliation uh, was something I just, you know, I had to do. And, and so I have an extra spring in my step uh, because of it. And, and what I like to say and, and is that, you know, sometimes reconciliation gets a bad rap. People go, oh, more woke BS. And, and what I tell people is it's an opportunity. And I look at it as a renaissance. So, you know, reconciliation to the rescue is renaissance, right? That's really what this is about. It's about massive opportunities to empower and lend a helping hand. Uh, and who hasn't had a helping hand? This is not about handouts. This is about let's share knowledge. Um, we have knowledge of the land. We have knowledge of Mother Earth. We, we have, you know, we, the world would be in a far better place if ancestral knowledge had actually been listened to. And we couldn't, have, we didn't have the science to prove it, but it's interestingly now, science is proving everything we've been saying for millennia. So, you know, it was just this, this confluence of events, um, this restlessness about, you know, there was, there has to be more to what I'm doing. And a moment in history too, right? I mean, there was an exogenous factor when, when the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People 
became the law two years ago. That, and while interpretive, just set a different context. Now, I'd also tell you that business leaders, pension plan uh, managers, aren't as well versed in what that means. And that's, uh, that's something that we have to do a better job of educating the business community on, that we, you know, we're open for business and we wanna be partners. And there's a huge opportunity in infrastructure in Canada. McKinsey suggests there's a $200 billion renewables infrastructure gap in Canada through to 2030. So when you think of total addressable market, that's just a section of what's, uh, you know, what's needed. And so, you know, when I, I like to do large businesses with big ideas, and so it was important that there was, there had to be a trillion plus dollar market for me to get pretty excited and so this you know it was a con like I said a confluence of events like you know you have you have a legal framework that changes that that's going to upset all of the inertia you've got a huge t in total addressable market you've got something you could feel really good by helping people who've been so disadvantaged and I've been fortunate not to be disadvantaged and so you know it's one of those things where it was uh, the perfect good storm you know <laughs> what a beautiful way to channel restlessness um, one of the things that, so we have an international audience for this podcast, and so there are a couple things I'd just love to get your, just a couple thoughts or, you know, a wider explanation on, you know, how we think about reconciliation in Canada, um, and also how, you know, the UN development has really, you know, changed the game, because you shared that as, you know, part of the, the story on your end. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's unfortunate because we're at a time in history where where all these international institutions seem to be ignored or, or uh, yeah, ignored is probably the best way. There are worse words, but we'll st we'll say with ignored. And uh, there has been an, uh, fantastic work that's been done, and, and the, you know. And, and my elders always say we have to say the full word, uh, the full name. So it's the United Nations Declarations on the Indi on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is one of those manifest improvements to the global approach to dealing with Indigenous peoples. And so, uh, you know, it's a shame that we're we're seeing some of that influence or you know being uh, on the wane rather than on the on the growth. And that's because you know, well, the geopolitical issues certainly uh, give rise to that, and and sort of the recession of liberal democracy. Uh, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, I, I think from our standpoint, as Indigenous peoples, we have an opportunity to really help, you know, if you help build First Nations, you're helping build the nation of Kanata, which is the original uh, word for Canada. And, and that's good for everybody. And this is a tide that lifts all boats. Uh, all canoes, I should say, perhaps, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and so, you know, when I think of, of how to move that even more rapidly, I think of global pools of capital entering into, you know, into Canada. And, and what's really interesting is I was with uh, with one of the large Maple 8 uh, pension plans and one of the fellows, or I think it was a fellow, yeah, it was, it was Adam, said, wow, I didn't realize that the world's largest emerging market opportunity actually was right here in Canada. And, you know, given it's an international audience, you know, it, it's really important to, to, that we get the message out um, that Canada's open for business. If you work with Indigenous peoples, given the, the strictures of, of the Indian Act, we actually are in control of entitlements on our land, which means we can get approvals for projects much more rapidly than you would otherwise uh, get. But we need capital. We need a lot of capital. Uh, I, I, I address the, the $200 billion and, and there's that's just in renewable. So when you look at other transmission lines that are required, uh, all based on hydropower, you look at, at wind power on the on the on the north coast of, of Quebec. Canada is open for business. We 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 have uh, a stable government, a relatively stable currency. So uh, you have all of the inherent upside of emerging markets, with none of the downside risk, right? And the geopolitical issues. You know, we're, we're pretty safe on Turtle Island, right? So so you know, I, I encourage folks to, to to really look at Canada and and look to deploy capital here. I think the uh, foreign direct investment in this country would be a very powerful tool and, and, and provide, you know, outstanding returns. And I encourage the pension plans who in Canada who have historically sort of, in, certainly in the last decade, sort of been going outside of the country. 
I'd say, hey, you know, take a look at Canada because there's so much in our own backyard here. And, and you know, I always draw attention to the fact that there's a, there's a, a very simple mission that pension plans have, right, which is, is to deliver superior risk-adjusted returns uh, in the best in- without undue risk and in the best interests of uh, contributors and beneficiaries. And so when I see pension plans open up in different you know, countries, I, I, I always scratch my head because did they forget the best interests of <laughs> contributors and beneficiaries or the people who live in Canada? And so if our infrastructure is dilapidated, if we're not investing in housing, that's impacting the best interests of the contributors and beneficiaries. And so, you know, it's a bit of a call to action to, to, to pension plans in this country to really focus on Canada uh, because that's how you're going to really help with the best interests of, of the contributors and, and, and uh, beneficiaries. And it's interesting when we look at some of the trends with limited partners who are investing in private equity firms, ESG has been all over the headlines for the past three to four years, recently with some interesting headlines that maybe we can get into. Um, but it's often when I ask you know, a general partner, what is it that's really pushing you to, to be interested in sustainability? It's, well, our limited partners are pushing us. So I'm wondering, when you turn your mind to some of the trends in sustainable investment or ESG, how, how does that tie in to what you're doing differently? Well, you know, we have the, the good fortune of being indigenous, and so we lead with our values. And uh, when you lead with your values, I often tell people, panels or in meetings, like ESG is just, you know, the co-option of what our seven sacred teachings are, right? And and so and we think of, of, of it problems holistically, uh, but there's a real marriage between ESG and what First Nations can do to, to move the yardsticks. We happen to uh, live on, uh, on a, a, a territory that has has vast mineral resources that are going to be uh, required. Maybe we have 32, I think, of the of the 34, whatever, uh, critical minerals. Um, and so working in concert with First Nations, with our understanding of the land and the land stewardship we've done since time immemorial, really provides an opportunity to, to, to really walk the walk and talk the talk, you know, uh, in a way that that helps everybody. So if you want to do a wind turbine, well, guess what? You, you need the special magnets and you need the critical minerals that exist in Canada. And geopolitically, it's good for, for our, you know, our OECD partners or certainly our G7 partners because, you know, uh, frankly, China's backyard is now Africa. They, they've, you know, with Belt and Road Initiative, uh, they, they've they've locked up a lot of the critical minerals. Russia is a bad actor on the on the stage, not, not dissimilar from China, and so. Canada is one of those unique places, and given the legal framework, given the volition of the First Nations to participate and be active partners, and given our volition and our culture to always share knowledge, I think we are incredibly well positioned to deal with proponents globally who want to come in and, and understand that approach. And, and so long as they come in with a lean-in approach, like tell us more about you know your Indigenous culture and your values, and, and, and sharing that knowledge, you know, I think it, Canada should be a, a, an economic leader, and we will never be a, a military might, but it, it seems right now, geopolitically, there's really only two ways you can pay, get anyone to pay attention to you. It's either you can flex nuclear muscles, or you can flex economic muscles. And I'd submit to, to your audience that Canada has uh, is supremely well positioned to flex its, its economic muscles. There are some systemic changes that need to occur. We need to streamline some of the approval processes, but but, you know, we have all of the necessary raw materials. We have a developed services economy. We have a, a you know, a, a group of, of people who are highly educated and capable, who understand big business, who understand that, uh, you know, our unique brand of capitalism, which is that compassionate piece, is really key. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it represents such a, a massive opportunity and and and. It's all going to be wrapped in ESG. We have, you know, on our in our fund, we've got a pipeline that's got over three billion dollars, and we just stopped adding to it because it's like, okay, there's there's too many, and and we haven't, you know, finished the fundraise, so we've got to slow that down. So we've got to stop priming the pump a little bit. Uh, but but you know, the First Nations Major Project Coalition suggests there's 575 billion dollars worth of transactions in the queue with their 134 nations that are participants in that. Uh, the Assembly of First Nations suggests there's a $349.2 billion gap on infrastructure in Canada alone. We're not even talking housing yet, right? So the opportunity is massive. 
And like I said, you've got none of the, the, uh, the risks that are typical of, of emerging markets. It's really interesting because, you know, hearing, you know, initially we started talking about, you know, the financial literacy and some of the goals and sort of educating potential port codes or communities where those port codes are, are working or investments are, are working. Um, and it really strikes me that there's also the opportunity for cross-pollination. So working with those communities and sort of at a fund level being leading in terms of, you know, Indigenous engagement, Indigenous principles, and then perhaps that also influencing the LP point of view which is interesting and not often something that's really considered. I don't know if that seems like an outlandish view, but... No, no, it's, look, you know, it, it, we made a commitment from the very beginning that we would never lose sight of our values and that we were going to make that a, a, a distinct part of our value proposition. And to that end, we gifted to 12 First Nations 5%, and, and your readers, or your, your listeners rather, are going to be going, wow, these guys are crazy, but we gifted 5% of the GP interest to 12 First Nations. We gifted 5% of the carry. And we also committed to spending 5% of our time in the mentorship piece. And, and that's important to, to make sure that there, that literacy curve trends in the right way. And recognizing that any of the proponents that come in, you know, if they come in with that spirit, uh, a spirit of, of sh- knowledge sharing will really have a positive impact. And I think they're going to learn so much. Um, my life has been massively enriched by, by my culture and, and the approach we take. The prism through which we look at life is vastly different. And I remember when I was a kid, um, I'm not much of a hunter because it just, maybe I'm just too sensitive, but I did hunt frogs because for frogs legs. But, you know, my mom very early told me, you know, you only kill the ones that are big enough that you can eat and try to avoid killing the, the, the female so that they can reproduce. And so, you know, I'd come back with, you know, out of my canoe with a bag full of, 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 of frogs legs and and we would eat all the frogs like so it, 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 it you know you, you enrich life when you can share but you also have respect for mother earth and all of her gifts uh, so you know and i think i think the beauty too is that proponents can have an opportunity to really help build capacity and skills for first nations um you know in engaging in these uh, in these partnerships um, so you know i think it, the approach is really key and uh and we're, we're proud of, of our 555 pledge. And, and you know, the, the more LPs and GPs that sort of understand that, and um, I think maybe maybe we can have that spread through the entire community, right? Because it's good business too, right? It, uh, and you can feel good every day about what you're doing. And that's really interesting. I'm wondering, because of course, with other funds, you know, they're probably, we have a couple uh, private equity listeners that I know are going to be tuning into this and thinking, how can I apply some of these ideas to, to my fund? The 555 is a great example. Are there any other principles, you know, you've spent time with colleagues, you know, in private equity, are there any other principles that you would recommend or that, you know, might help others to adopt some of the lenses that uh, you grew up with and you're applying now? So, well, one of the other things that, that's intimately linked to the 555 pledge is what we refer to as the, the SIM program, the scholarship, internship, and mentorship. So all of the partners are, are, are you know, are, are contributing dollars for scholarships uh, for Indigenous people. You know, I mentioned I had, I had, I went to a great school and, and it changes your world view. And so that's an important, the scholarship piece and making sure that we, you know, education sort of is at the, at the front end of life uh, so that you can go on to lead a, the most full life you possibly can. Uh, but another area we're really keen on is it's really tough uh, to get into finance unless you have those summer internships, whether it's a, with a GP or an LP or any type of financial institution. So we're really big on, on promoting that internship, but it's not exclusive to, to Longhouse. What we do is we, we use our extensive network in New York, London, Toronto, Montreal, and to some a lesser extent, but also in Vancouver, to find Indigenous kids and give them those opportunities that there is such a thing as finance for good. Uh, that is something that, that it is a creative industry. Uh, you know, Indigenous people you know, all, all do a lot of art. And so I always try to frame finance as one of the most creative industries you can get, get into. I, I've done, you know, deal structures can be very unique. Solving problems um, with finance is something 
something that, that has that can deliver on positive outcomes. And, and if there's one thing we know in finance, we drive capital and we also have to drive trust. And, and so that's part of the, the, the internship piece. And of course, the mentorship is that ongoing participation. So, you know, I, I, uh, I had the, the, the great luxury of recruiting a couple of Squamish kids that I, you know, and, and while I'm no longer at Anshikai, the Economic Development Corporation of the Squamish Nation, I still mentor them, you know, and, and, and that's, uh, that's an incredibly rewarding thing. And so, you know, I think, I think when, when you give back, you, you get so much more in return, it's almost unfair. And, and it's, it's a habit like anything else. You know, at first it may feel weird. It may feel like, why am I doing this? But I'm proud to say that there, there's, there's massively positive impacts. And, and, uh, and, and you know, the future uh, is really in the hands of, of, of the youth. And so it's important that we mentor, we, we share our values, and, and, and also keep an open mind to learning from them. My final question for you, Fred, is just a question around, and now it can be a book, it can be an article, but a question that I love to ask guests on the podcast is, you know, has there been a particular, you know, book, article, you can even share an experience that's really framed the way you think in your career and has led you to where you are? Yeah, I mean, there, there's countless books, uh, I, 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 countless stories in my culture and maybe the, the simplest is a story. Um, at a young age, I, I was, I had the, the good fortune of, of someone seeing a little sparkle in my eye and, and sort of taking that mentorship approach with me. Um, not to get too personal, but my, my father uh, suffered from early onset Alzheimer's. And so, you know, I, I lost him at a very young age uh, and I didn't have that sort of, that, that mentor, that, that father figure. Um, and thankfully, I had a very, very powerful and strong mom who is just phenomenal. And, and you know, my culture is matrilineal, so I'm, I'm still very close to her. But, you know, she she was able to to mentor me in, in a way and, and, and share, I guess, you know, um, help me develop my feminine side. And I think that's something that that fills you out as a human, right? It's it's uh, you know you, you've got your buddies, but and and I didn't have the benefit of a dad, but a very powerful and and, and bright shining woman uh, named Diane, my mom, who uh, who helped guide me and um, you know was my my lodestar, if you will. And so uh, you know I, I owe so much to her. She's the one who um, who really uh, helped me through the tough times, who who helped guide me, and who was uh, my unaware. Uh, support uh, through through you know look everybody has challenges in, in, in their our journey and and so I, I'd say it was it was her guidance and counsel and, and unwavering support so less of a story more a, a little bit shout out to my mom but she certainly deserves it so. I'm smiling from ear to ear what an amazing story Fred thank you so much for joining the Future and Sound podcast it was my pleasure thank you so much Jennifer really appreciate it. Thank you to Fred for joining us. You can learn more about his work by checking out the links in the episode description or by visiting re.co.com slash the future and sound. The future and sound podcast is written and hosted by Jen Wilson and produced by Chris Attaway. This podcast is brought to you by Rico, a software as a services company helping clients achieve resilient competitive advantage in the long term. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to tell a friend about it. And if you have a moment, rate us in your podcast app. Until next time, thanks for listening. Listening.